one of the people that was going to watch tonight or have questions had to jump off early. So I think the earlier we get started, the better. Okay. So anyway, I uh, just want to thank everybody that's here this evening. Thanks for joining the free webinar uh, hosted by myself, Jason Walker. And uh, tonight's topic is uh, discount points or buying down your interest rate or using a, I think Trevor's going to talk about a 2-1 or a 3-2-1 buy down all of which can be beneficial and and uh, benefit yourself both short-term and long-term as far as getting mortgages on real estate. Um, anyway, I've been selling real estate since 2010 and uh, yeah, do it full-time and haven't looked back. Uh, Trevor, how about yourself? What, uh, how long you been doing mortgages? Long time. I started in 1997. 97 that's when you got started yeah yeah i've been doing this a long time so uh basically got out of college and did a couple years at a bank and then started a mortgage and been in it ever since so it's been that's a awesome. good run been in gillette since 1999 i opened up shop here so i love it i didn't i didn't realize that 1997 yeah golly yeah. you're you're coming into your 20 year mark uh yeah and uh when i got in there's no internet and uh no you didn't use cell phones and so it's changed a lot since the beginning it was a lot yeah. easier now well back then it was easier to get loans but it's a lot easier process now so yeah well i'll let you take it away okay. um and then if we got questions i think as far as people that are watching uh just drop uh, questions in the comment section and we'll try to hammer it out as we go or hammer them out at the end either one yeah okay so what i'd like to start with is kind of explaining how the starting interest rate works most people don't know this um i think most people think that you know when you see an interest rate you're just like oh that's the rate for the day uh, that's not actually how it works um Every loan has what's called loan level pricing adjustments, okay? And what those are, those are the items that affect what would be your base rate. So whatever your normal starting interest rate would be, those all these items that I'm going to list actually affect what that rate is. So all these items will go into effect before you can even look at knowing what your starting rate would be for the day. Uh, for your loan, and then you will go into talking about how you can buy that down or what you can do to try to lower that. So all those items that affect the rate before you even get quoted an interest rate, um, there's type of loan, uh, your credit score, your loan to value, which is basically how much your down payment is, or if you're doing a refinance, how much your house is worth versus what you're borrowing. Um, your property type affects it, whether it is uh, just a standard stick built single family home, or if it's a two unit, three unit, four unit, um, if it's a manufactured home, if it is a double wide or a single wide or a modular. Um, what people don't usually know too is lots of times there's a property location adjustment being state. Um, most states there's adjustments they're not very large but in some states there is a negative hit for being in that area um, and sometimes there's also a debt ratio effect on your interest rate too uh, which you would think would be reversed but sometimes when your interest rate is higher you actually take a higher interest rate which negatively affects everybody because your debt ratio is already high you want the best rate you can get so mm -hmm. after all those items go into effect, that's basically where your start rate is for the day for your particular loan and what you qualify for. Now, once that loan is determined and what your rate's going to be, that's when you can start looking at ways to try to better that rate. Um, you know, most of the time, you know, in my history of doing this, I don't usually try to lock someone's rate the first day. Um, I, I play the market a little bit. I do watch every day. I have a live ticker on my computer that shows me what the bond markets are doing, what the stock market's doing. Um, it used to be a little easier to determine day by day what rates were going to do by watching those items. Uh, I did that for 25 years, and it usually worked out really well. Um, it's odd that when COVID hit, those things changed. So it's not as easy now to determine what's going to happen by what the markets are doing. Um, it used to be really, I was confident by watching the bond market, 
whether it was going up or down, I could determine what rates were going to do. Now that's not always the case, uh, especially if you've seen what's going on in the markets the last two weeks. Bond market's been rising, stock market's been rising. All of those things would normally negatively affect interest rates and they'd go up, but rates have dropped significantly in the last 10 days. Um, you know, base rate, uh, we were we're down to about six to six and a quarter, depending on who you are and what you qualify for. Uh, it wasn't even a month ago, we were almost eight. Right. So that much of a drop that fast is very unusual. Um, and if you watch what's going on in the world, you wouldn't think it'd be happening, but it is. So it's a good thing for everybody. So, um, you know, people are already starting to talk about refinances that have closed in the last six months. Um, I'm not going to say it's a bad idea because it's very possibly could help you to do that. Um, but one thing to consider is the amount of time you've been on your loan, uh, because if you refinance within the first six months, it does actually negatively affect who gave you your loan to start with. Um, most people don't know this, but if the loan doesn't season for six months, uh, an investor or lender like myself, we actually get hit back with penalties for that loan closing that fast and getting paid off. So if you are short-term loan and you're looking to refinance, it, it would actually be very beneficial to your original lender to go talk to them about it before you do that. Um, the other thing is, you know, the expectations are rates are probably going to get better again over the next six to 10 months. Um, a lot of that is because it's an election year. Um, you know, I've been doing this a long time. I've been through four or five presidential elections. Everybody wants to stay in office. Uh, lots of good things can happen as far as what the markets do and what rates are going to do over that time. You can't guarantee it. You can't set your watch to it, but it does usually happen. So those are all things to consider. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my one of my screens now, and I'm going to kind of give you guys some information here. Um, hopefully you can see this. Yep. So what this is, <clears throat> this is just a calculator for doing a buy down. Okay, so there's there's two different types of interest rate buy downs. There is the temporary buy down and the permanent buy down. Um, the temporary buy down has been around for a long time, but it hasn't necessarily been used very often. Okay, um, there's a couple items I'd like to share with you about the temporary that most people probably don't know and don't understand. So. Um, this has become common in the most recent time, the last six to eight months, and it's because interest rates raised so much so fast, okay? Um, it was kind of a shock to the system how fast they rose. And what that did is it started costing people their homes because lots of people were qualified to purchase a home that was being built. Okay. And what would happen was when they started to build on their home, interest rates were three and a half, four percent well, by the time their house was done, if it took four to five months to build that new house, rates had risen drastically over that time. And the next thing you know, people weren't able to qualify because the payments went up so much. So one reason this became popular, and it became very popular with uh, builders and selling agents of new construction. And the reason it became popular is because it was a way to get that house payment down in the beginning um, when you bought. So uh, the most common ones of the temporary are the three, two, one and the two, one buy downs. Okay. And basically what you're doing with this type of loan, you're prepaying interest. Okay. So at closing, there is a sum of money that's put into escrow. Okay. So basically if you look at your screen, you're going to see an example of this. Um, and what I did is I just used generic figures. These figures are just, for example, only they're not what things are today, but it's it makes it very clear how this particular buy down works. OK, so if you look at your screen, the loan amount on this was three hundred thousand. OK, and just to make it easy math, I said the interest rate was eight percent. And one of the reasons I use eight percent, because that was kind of the high point in the last six months. So if you're doing a 30 year loan. At eight percent on three hundred thousand dollars, which is a very common loan size these days, your monthly payment on that for principal and interest only was two thousand two hundred one dollars and twenty nine cents. Okay, so that's quite a big 
sum of money, especially for what we've been used to in the past 15 years with what interest rates were doing and what payments would be. Okay. So what this example here is, is it's got the three, two, one and the two, one on it. And if you look at this, if you started out at 8% and you did the three, two, one buy down. Okay. And so what that means is the first year of your loan, your interest rate is now 3% lower than your actual rate. Okay. After the first year's up, then it goes to 2% better than your actual rate. Third year is 1%. Fourth year, it goes to what your normal rate is going to be, which is your fixed 8%. Okay. So that's how you get the 321 name for buy down because you bought it down three years in a row and that rate would change. Now, if you look at the top here where it says 321, um, you'll see what the cost of this buy down is. Okay. So to do this particular buy down on this loan example, the cost of that buy down is $14,386.20. So at closing of your loan, that's how much money is due paid in cash. So that's added on to your closing cost. And what that is, is you're not saving anything by doing this buy down, but it's making your monthly payment significantly less. So if you look at there, when you're starting out at 5%, that drops that payment to 1610. So you're saving $590 a month. You go down to the year number two, your payment jumps to 1798, you're saving 402 a month. Get to number three, you're at 1995, you save 205 a month. Okay, those are great figures. And this actually gives you a really good idea of how prices of mortgages have changed in the last few months, because we were at 5% not long ago is your start rate. And look at the difference in payment from what it was from eight. It's a lot of money. Um, now, if you add up those months of what you saved, it comes out to exactly $14,386. And the reason this tool became useful is because builders had a surplus of homes sitting on the market. And, you know, when a builder builds a house, for the most part, they're borrowing money for that. And they're paying interest on that loan while that house sits there. And for most builders, they have more than one that's sitting on the market and they're not moving because of interest rates. So you, you've all probably seen ads in the last year where on the marketing, they're saying, we're going to give you 15,000 or just any number for you to put towards your closing costs. This is where this loan came into play. So basically what's happening is the builder or seller um, was putting this extra money from what they made for proceeds of you buying the home towards your interest and all this money would go into an escrow account. <clears throat> so what happens is every month when you make your payment, your investor, lender, mortgage, would they go into this account and they use these funds to subsidize your payment. So when you made your payment, your first payment of 1610, they go into the escrow, uh... they pull that additional $590 out and then your full payment of your 2201 was made. It works great as long as you're not the one who had to put up the 14,000 up front. Because if you're doing this particular type of loan and you're paying for this yourself, you're not actually saving any money. Because when you add it all up together, it comes out to exactly if you'd have kept your loan at 8% and made the payment. Um, this became popular and it went away real fast. Um, builders were producing this and, you know, it was working, but it wasn't something that could last a long time because for the most part, builders don't have this huge chunk of money sitting there from their proceeds to go, but it helped them move properties so they could start building something else. So it was a very useful tool. Um, it just was kind of short lived. Uh, it is still. Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> it is still available. Um, I did see somebody advertising this on some properties in Gillette just a couple weeks ago. And I did actually talk to the builder about it. Um, and it's something that 
you know, he's got several homes built and he's trying to get them moved. And, you know, the thing about this product is it works great to start um, and it helps you on your monthly payment. Now, when you look for this loan, you still have to qualify personally for the entire amount. So you're not making that payment, but it doesn't let you qualify for more money because you still have to qualify for your loan with your debt ratio um, off the 8% number that we're starting with here. So if you qualify for the 8%, you qualify for this loan too, as long as somebody else was producing the funds to buy it down. Um, the one nice thing about this loan is it's a temporary buyout. So the funds were put in there up front, they're still sitting there, okay? So what anti what's anticipated, you know, coming up with interest rates, even now they've come down a lot, their pro production should actually force them down some more over the next year. At least that's what we're all thinking. The nice thing about this loan is it doesn't stop you from refinancing. So you're, you, you get this loan, you've paid on it for 18 months. So you had your first year at 5%, you've paid the 6% for six months, rates drop back to five just for example. So we get back to five, which is your fixed rate five. You can refinance this loan. You don't lose that money that was put into the escrow for your subsidy. They will mm -hmm. give that back to you because it's your money. They, they don't keep it because it's temporary. So if you do refi, those funds that are left that weren't used are going to be more than likely, they're just going to reduce it off of your payoff of your home. But some investors might actually just re send it back to you like any escrow and refund it to you. So it, it is useful in that tool. Um, we haven't done many of them um, because it's just something that just has, hasn't been used a lot. Okay. So if that's example number one. I did do another one here just to give you an idea of different figures. So... This one, I did a $250,000 loan amount at 7%, um, which would be more accurate for where things have been here the last couple weeks. So this one would drop your interest rate to four the first year, five, then six, but it still costs $11,463 up front to do this. So it adds up really fast on the total. Um, but it does a, it does allow you to have a lower monthly payment. So if you can get the seller or the buyer to contribute to this, your money ahead, uh, it's just it's difficult to get somebody to do that because margins are tight right now on the building side. You know, if building's expensive and prices are expensive, um, and I just don't think most builders have enough room to do this. But if they do, it is definitely a great idea for you to take it because it does work well. And if you're not having to put the funds in yourself, hey, it, it just gets you a better payment. Like I said, you can always move out of it and those funds come back to you one way or another. So so it is a good item that you can possibly use to help you. You know, maybe your debt ratio is good, but you do have some other expenses that we don't count, you know, into getting your loan. You know, we don't have to worry about daycare. We don't have to worry about home insurance or health insurance. Um, those things don't affect what we do on the mortgage side. So what we use for debt ratio isn't necessarily as accurate as what it could be for your particular situation, because you could have some expenses that we don't have to count, you know, and daycare is a big one. You know, car insurance can be a big one. You know, if you travel for work, you might have expenses that we don't have to use for you to qualify for your loan. So this could be a great way to subsidize your debt ratio to get you the ability to do this, knowing that you're either going to refinance this loan later, or maybe you're expecting a change in your pay. Maybe you know you're getting promoted in a year or you're moving on. You know, if you're changing properties and you're buying now, but you know you're getting moved for your job to a new city in a couple of years, this is a great tool to use for that especially if you can get the seller to pay it because you're, you're going to be ahead of where you normally would be um, by doing this. So it is a very useful tool. It, it works well if your situation is right. So um, I don't see any questions popping up about the temporary buy down. Um, uh, Trevor, we did back up a second. We did have a question on back when you were talking about when, uh, when to do a refinance and let the loan season. The question was, 
if your loan was sold to a different agency, what do you think about the timeline there? So it goes from your start point of your loan. So it goes from the date you closed. So your loan could have been closed. It's sometimes it can close several times or move several times in the first couple months. Um, it's unusual now, you know, usually, usually the investor who does the original purchasing of the loan, they usually keep them for a while now. But I have seen situations where sometimes they get sold numerous times fairly quickly, which can be confusing. Um, but your terms of when the penalties for your lender would stop would still be six months from the day you closed. So, you know, like myself, I'm a mortgage bank. OK, so I'm not a mortgage broker. I'm a mortgage bank. There's a difference. And what we do is since we're a bank, we do everything from the beginning through the end. And what I mean by that is, you know, we start with the application. We take the loan all the way through funding. Everything is in-house. All the processing is in-house. All the underwriting is in-house. The funding is in-house. We do all of it. So your loan is completely 100% done when we close. And we did all of the work from the beginning through that end. And then what we do is we end up selling your loan to an investor. Um, and then that investor does the servicing for you, which is who you'd make your payments to. If you have customer service questions, you know, if you have an escrow question, that's where you'd go. Now, you, that can change several times, but if you're going to refi, what you would want to do is probably just talk to the original person that did your loan just to make sure they don't get penalized um, because it will come back on them. If you if you redo your loan, you know, in two, three, four months, they will get a call um, and they will be forced to pay back anything they made on that loan. So, you know, it in times like right now, it's something that could be worrisome for a lender like myself. Um, I've been doing this a long time. It's just one of the things we deal with. Um, so hopefully that helped answer your question. Um, so what we're going to talk about next is permanent buy down. OK, and the permanent buy down is what I think everybody is used to seeing. Um, so when you do this buy down, it's for the life of the loan. OK, so so you buy this down at closing. Your interest rate is fixed at that rate. It doesn't change. It stays the same. You don't have any of the adjustments like the temporary does. Um, the temporary is good for what it is. But if you're going to spend this much money of your own funds up front, it might be a better idea to go with the permanent buy down. Um, the rate's not going to drop as much as the temporary, but it is going to stay there for the amount of time you have the loan. OK, so what I'm going to show you guys now is kind of what we see when we're looking at uh, locking an interest rate. So the screen that you've got there that you can see now, <clears throat> this is the information that goes into when we price a loan out. And we use a system that's called OB is what it's called. And it's one of the more popular ones. It's been around for a long time. But what it does is it takes our information and feeds it through with all of our invest investors so that we can see what's out there available for everybody. So this is just the loan information here. You got a loan amount of 240,000. The house is worth 300,000. So you're doing 20% down. Our borrower is JW, if anybody knows why I use JW. He's on the screen with you right now. Um, I just threw in a, a credit score of a 760, just kind of an average loan, and then um, debt ratio of 45%. These are all just things that are, they're just kind of down the road, middle of the road, general information to try to get us to price out a property. Um, as you can see down here, it's a primary residence. It's a stick built house. It's only one unit. Uh, and it's in Campbell County in Wyoming, and it gives our zip code. So then after we have that part, then it takes us to the second screen. And what you see here is what type of loan it is. So I'm, we're just running this as conforming, which is a conventional loan. You can see here there's non-conforming FHA, VA, um, USDA, which is rural development. So if we were doing a different style of loan, those boxes would be changed. Uh, we're doing a 30-year amortization with a fixed rate. Um, the type of loan, it's just standard. You've got your normal approval for desktop underwriting is how it's going to price it out. 
So once you go into this and you hit submit, <clears throat> what happens next is it brings up this screen. And as you can see down here on the right next to the blacked out section, I had to black that out because that's uh, things you guys aren't able to see because I can't allow you to see it. But each one of these lines here is a different investor. So when I price out a loan, I can get up to 15 investors that come through here, but it always pulls the top five or six to the top. And what it does is it takes the rate I put in at six and a half, which was what I was shooting for for start rate on this example. And when you see price over here, what that price is, is that means that's the cost of getting the loan. So as a lender and a borrower, you're always shooting for what we call par rate. Okay. And what par means is you're at a hundred percent. So this 98.75 right here, which is the best price I could get when I did this example, it's under par. Now to get that six and a half percent, what that means is that's going to cost money to get six and a half percent because you didn't get to par. So since it's not at a hundred that we are shooting for, it's now costing you one and a quarter points, basis points to get that loan. Um, what I would do from here is over here where it says show details. So what I do is the top investor, which would be the top line, I would click the show. And what happens is that's going to take us to the next screen. And that brings us into that investor. Okay. So where I blacked it out on top, that would be the name of the investor and the product for just that company. So we eliminated the other 14 investors and went strictly into this investor to see what the rest of their markings are under that loan. So if you look over here on the left, these are all of the interest rates you could get for this particular loan. But the problem is when you look next to it where it says price, that's what you determine what cost is going to be. Because none of these rates are par until you get down. The closest to par is 7%. Okay, so 7% is 99.875 points to get that particular rate for that day. You're shooting for 100, so we're an eighth short, okay? So remember, this loan is $240,000 is what we're shooting at. And our par rate is basically seven. So if you do the math on that and you're trying to get 7% today, you have to take your $240,000 loan amount times an eighth of a percentage point. So to lock this rate right now on that example at 7% is going to cost the borrower 7% or excuse me, $300. So you're going to get charged $300 at closing to get 7% on this example. Now, this is where we're going to get into the buy down port portion because this is where now you can determine if it's worth it or not, or where you want your rate to be. So if you're, you see down here where it says seven, and that's going to cost you $300. Well, we want six and a half. That's your goal to get six and a half. So you go up to the six and a half, which is highlighted in orange, and that's 98.75. Okay. What that means is that's going to cost one and a quarter percentage points to get you locked at six and a half. So you, to do that, this is where your buy down comes into play. So to get six and a half on this, this example, you're buying your rate down with one and a quarter basis points, and it's lowering your interest by one half of a percentage point. Okay. So you got basis points, you got interest rate. Basis points is what it costs to get you an interest rate. So your goal for today is six and a half percent, okay? So let's take your $240,000 loan amount and we take that times one and a quarter basis points. That is basically $3,000. So if you're sitting at my desk and you want me to lock this at six and a half percent for this loan, it's gonna cost you $3,000 to get six and a half on this particular example. 
And what I do as a lender, I've been doing this a long time and I've come to find this is the best tool for me to explain this to people when they're talking about buy downs. Okay. <laughs> so let's take, you got the $3,000 to get you six and a half percent. I could also get you 7% that was going to only cost you $300. All right. So let's figure out what the payment difference is. So if you make a payment on $240,000 at 7%, principal and interest only, that's $1,596 per month. Okay. Now you want six and a half percent. So you're telling me, yep, I want six and a half. I'll give you the $3,000 to buy it down, which we can do no problem. Now, this is where I go, okay, so your payment on 6.5% is $1,516.96, okay? So by giving $3,000 up front, you lowered your monthly payment by $79.77, and that's forever, okay? You did that permanently. That's the way it's going to be. It's going to stay there until you sell the house, refinance the house, or pay off the loan. Now, what I do is your 7% was going to cost you $300. The 6.5% is costing you $3,000. So I take the $3,000. I subtract the $300 that you were going to pay for 7%. So we got $2,700 is the difference in those interest rates. Okay. Now, take your monthly savings, which is $79.77. Take your cost difference of the $2,700, divide that by the $79.77. And it shows you how many payments you're going to make before you break even. And when I say break even, I'm talking about the $2,700 you invested up front. It's going to take... 33.8 payments for you to be break even, okay? So you got 2.8 years of payments to compensate for your original $2,700 difference investment in that rate. This is where you have to make the decision if this makes sense or not. Now, if you know you're not going to be in this house for three years, basically, I'm going to tell you not to do this because you're going to lose money because you're not going to earn back enough in your monthly savings to compensate for your investment up front to save the $79 every month. If you know you're going to be in this house for a long time and you don't think rates are going to ever drop, you don't think you're going to refinance in the first three years, this is a great deal. I mean, right now it's very volatile out there. You don't know what rates are going to do. You know, the experts are saying they're going to come down and they have come down some, but nobody knows for sure what's ever going to happen. So if 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 you're not a, if you're a gambler and you think rates are going to stay up, they're going to go up more. They're not going to change. You're going to be in this house a while by doing this particular example. You're putting money in your pocket after two point eight years. So every payment you make after those first two point eight years you're money ahead every single month. No matter what you do, you're always money ahead. But if you sell the house, you've lost part of your investment on that rate. Um, if rates drop significantly and you want to do a refinance, this one isn't like the temporary. When you refinance this one, you've lost that buy down. Now, so you do this seven, eight months from now, rates go back to 5%. You're going to want to refinance at 5% if you can, even though you're going to lose part of that investment. If you can get the 5% fixed with, and that's with no buy down or no other extra charges, you're still going to be money ahead over the long term. By a, by a long shot, you're going to be money ahead. So buy downs are a tool that they do make sense, um, but your situation is what's going to determine that. Um, you know, if you've got... If you've got cash available and you want to buy a house and monthly payment is your biggest concern because you really want, say, $1,500 a month and you've got money up front and the buy down doesn't doesn't worry you, it's a great deal. Because if your monthly expenditures is your biggest concern, you can do this type of buy down and it's going to make that 
where you're not stressed when you're making your payment because you know you can budget for it and you don't have to worry about it going up. It's not going to change in a year. It's not going to change again in two years. It's going to stay there. Your principal and interest will never change on this loan. The only thing that can affect your monthly payment going up or down is going to be your escrow. You don't have any control over that. <clears throat> you don't know if the taxes are going to go up. You don't know if your insurance is going to change. You know, those are all just life items you can't predict. You don't know. You don't know if, you know, we live in the hail, you know, area. You don't know if you're going to have a hail claim. It could make your insurance go up. All those things can affect your payment. But if by doing this, it's fixed. So your principal and interest portion stays the same for the amount of time you have your loan. Um, we haven't seen buy downs used a lot in the last 10, 12 years. And the reason for that, rates have been fantastic. I mean, if, if you can get three and a half percent fixed as your base rate, there's no reason to buy it down. I mean, why buy it down? You're already at three and a half percent and that's going to be fixed for 30 years. So you wouldn't buy it down. So you didn't use this very often because rates have been so good for so long. It was just something that didn't really need to happen because it was just rates were so fantastic that you wouldn't want to buy it down because you're already at such a great rate. Now the markets have changed. Rates have gone up. Rates are more volatile. And this can be a way to make that where if you see the house you really want, it's the perfect house. Jason shows you the house and it's it's exactly what you want. The price is what you want, but the payment might be just a little high because of rates. This could be a way where you can still get in that house. You can still make the monthly payment. You know, you don't have to, you're not house poor. You know, you can still take your kids to Disneyland for Christmas because you're not house poor. You know, so this is a great tool for that, that, it can allow you to maybe achieve those goals you weren't be able to do if you had to stay at the base rate. So it's something to think about. It's always, and it's very easy to determine the numbers, you know, once you're pre-qualified and we're looking at figures, this whole process that we just went through to figure out what this is going to cost, I can do it in five minutes. It, it's not difficult at all. And I can give you the examples you know, of what it is and how it's going to, how you can affect what your rate's going to do and how much it's going to cost. It's just a matter of how much you want to invest into it up front. And to determine that, it's very easy. We can just run the figures. Um, the other thing that I do when somebody wants to buy it down, you know, those are funds that are normally coming out of your pocket unless you're doing the temporary um, and the builder's giving you the funds. Now you can use builder funds for that to do a permanent buy down as well. You just, your rate won't drop as much on a permanent, but it does work for this as well. So if, you know, if they're doing a $15,000 investment into you buying the home, you can take that 15,000 and do a permanent buy down and lock your rate in and it's fixed. It's not going to change. So that's an option as well. Um, these are going to be used a lot more now than they were in the past and it's just because rates the rate market's changed it's changed is is it ever going to go back to what it was I, i'm going to guess in my career probably not i don't know that for sure anything can happen i've been doing this a long time um but i don't think in the amount of time i'm left in the mortgage industry i'm going to guess we're not going to see two and a half percent three percent again uh, i hope i'm wrong I really hope I'm wrong, but I, I just don't think it's going to happen. I think, you know, the people that guide this stuff and kind of control it, I think they're going to keep them higher than that. Um, my personal expectations, and this is just my opinion, this, no, this is nobody else's opinion but mine, I think we're probably going to get back to five, right around five. I don't think it's going to go under that anytime soon. Um, I hope I'm wrong. I mean, life was good when we were handing out two and a half to three and a half percent rates. Uh, Jason's smiling. He knows you know, property was a lot easier to get a hold of when rates were that low. Um, but I think this is just going to be the way it is. I, I think, you know, they've dropped a lot in the last two weeks. Um, hopefully it continues, but nobody knows. Um, anybody that tells you they know exactly what's going to happen with rates, um, I'd like to hire them because it'd be really useful for me to be able to have somebody that knows. 
Um, it's no different than the stock market. You you know, you never know from day to day what's going to happen. I mean, there's people that can predict it really well. Rates are the same. It's just, you, you know, you can get an educated guess on what they're going to do, but you can't know for sure what's going to happen. And this might be a really good way for somebody to be able to get into that house that they maybe couldn't get at six and a half or seven percent. So it's something that's going to help a lot of people, I think, now that we didn't need before. And it's something that's always going to be available. Um, we can do this on any type of loan. I mean, you can do this on a conventional of an FHA, a VA, an RD. Um, the, the only loan that doesn't allow a buy down, um, at least in the Wyoming, is the first time home buyer program. Um, the first time home buyer program is a bond program. So what happens is WCDA, they get a bulk of money that they buy on a particular coupon and that money is fixed at that rate. That's what it is. So every day I get an email from WCDA and it shows what their rates are. Their standard program, the rate doesn't change very, very often. I mean, it's months between the changes in rates there. It's because they have those funds already locked in at that money. They don't allow a buy down on that um they they just don't this is what their rate is this is what you're offered that's what they allow until those funds run short and they have to replace them and then they will change the rate and whatever the new coupon is is what the rate will be um you know in the last six eight months wcda was at 5.75 percent okay they changed it about a month or so ago their bond ran out they had to replace it it jumped it up to 6.375 but when they were at 575, there were days that that first time homebuyer program was 2% better than any other loan on the market. So if you qualified for the first time home prior homebuyer program, that's what I was giving you because you were two points ahead of everything else. So that's the only loan that doesn't allow a buy down. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention while I still had this screen up is you can see if you go towards the bottom, if you look at 7.625% on that screen, it says 101, okay? Now remember, par is our number we're shooting for, which is 100. Well, this is over par. What that 1% is, that's what we call premium pricing, okay? That's money that you get back towards your other closing costs. So when you see those advertisements where it used to be common, you don't see it right now, but you'd see the ad from somebody online that says no closing costs for this rate. The reason there was no closing costs is because they were premium pricing their interest rate. They were taking the premium pricing and they were paying for your appraisal and your title work and all those things that they said you weren't paying. You were actually paying them. You are just paying them in rates. So you are paying them on a monthly basis in your interest rate because your interest rate was higher than what it could have been. This again can be a useful tool. When rates are really low, this was very common. You know, when we were in the threes, I could premium price this if you were really short on funds. You 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 afford the house, you had no problem with the payments, but you were just short on cash, you couldn't cover all your closing costs. We could premium price this at say 375 when they were three and a half or three and a quarter, I could give you some money back. It'd show up as a credit on your closing statement. And I just paid for your appraisal, your title work for you. And you didn't have to have that in cash. So these are all things that you can do with interest rates that most people don't realize is out there. And you can do buy downs and you can do premiums. So, you know, the basically what it is, is you want to see where par is for the day. And you start from there and you see what makes sense. Does does doing a buy down make sense for me today? You know, or does premium pricing make a sense right now? Do I need the cash given me to closing so I can get in this house? Or do you just take par? And, you know, for a long time, par was the number. Um, par was where we were because nobody needed to do a buy down and premium pricing was there. But, you know, most of the time we were getting seller paid closing costs when the market was hot. And you could get into the house for your earnest money. Um, pretty tough to do that now, but it did work that way for a long time. So, um, so there's all sorts of options you can do with interest rates that can help you, you know, get into that loan, get into that house. And, you know, some of them are very helpful and it can make your payments better. It can make your closing costs better. There are all options out there. And then there's a lot to consider when you're looking at this. And, you know, as a lender, 
I go over these things with my borrowers while they're sitting with me so they know what they're getting into um, and what their options are. I don't know what other lenders do for this, if they give you these options or not. Um, I always do just because, you know, you're the one that has to make the payment. You have to feel like you can afford the payment. Um, you know, what, what's your comfort level? Where Where's your monthly payment that you know you're not going to struggle with? And that's where these things come into play, that we can try to get you into that, um, depending, it might cost you some money up front, or it might not. It just depends on what rates are doing. Um, you know, rates are a moving target. We get interest, different interest rates every single day. Um, they change a little bit every day. Sometimes they change a lot. Uh, some days they can change two, three times in a day. You, you don't know. It all depends on what the market's moving at that's causing the cost of their bond to be higher or lower and what coupon is selling better. It, it just depends on how the market's flowing with what's buying and selling, and it forces these rates to change. Sometimes you might see interest rates, the actual rate themselves, be the same for a few days in a row. But if you look at the price, the price is changing every day. Um, some days you might have a quarter bonus for doing that six and a half. Some days it might cost you a quarter to do six and a half. But you're looking for the number that gets you as close to par as you can. And sometimes it's a little above and sometimes it's a little above, below. <clears throat> excuse me. But it's changing all the time. And you know, normally when we see numerous rate changes in a day, it's not a good thing. Um, you hardly ever see numerous changes in a day where rates got better. Usually it's when they're getting worse. And it's usually because the mortgage-backed securities are failing in the market that day, and they can drop 100 basis points in a day. And if it drops 100 basis points in one day, rates are going to change two, three times for the worse. Um, it doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. It's happened more in the last two years than I've seen it happen probably in the previous 10 to that. And it's something I watch religiously every single day, all day. It's it's constantly on my screen. I check it probably 100 times a day just to see what's going on so we can try to have an idea of how these rates are going to affect what's going on. So um, that is about all I had for you guys today. So I don't know if there's any more questions popping there, up. There is a question here, Trevor. Okay. Uh, is there is there any buy down after you close on a loan? No, no. Once once you're closed, there's no way to change that rate. Um, once you've signed your papers and that loan is funded, the only way you can ever change your interest rate is doing a refinance. So you're going through the process again. Well, I'm going to add a couple of remarks. Uh, what you've offered so far is stellar information. Some of this stuff I'd never even seen before. I've been doing this quite a while myself. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm going to add uh, something. I've per working with buyers in my past experience. It sometimes doesn't matter the interest rate environment as it does the payment level that the buyer's uh, comfortable with. So yeah. I've I've personally used uh, the permanent buy down option when interest rates were super low, and I've used them in like today this year's interest rate environment when they were super high, um, and I I think it so I think it's something that's overlooked quite a bit, especially on the purchasing side. Yeah. Even though it spells out in the purchase the Wyoming State purchase contracts, uh, the first or second page. Buyer closing costs, the second item that they they list there is discount points. Yet everybody overlooks yep. them. Yep. And I think that's a grave mistake for a lot of people, um, all of which we try to coach on quite a bit. But uh, I'm, just one, I'm just one point of view. There's millions of points of views out there. Um, uh, one of the first things I do when somebody comes in to see me that I haven't talked to before, um, one of the first questions I ask them is, how much house are you looking at? What kind of price range? And where do you want your payment? Mm -hmm. And the reason I ask that question about payment is because when somebody comes in and they're looking at qualifying, 99% of the time, they have a number in their head of what they think they can afford. And I'll be honest with you, 
the when I go in and I start qualifying someone, I shoot for that payment. Because if you come into me and you tell me I can afford $2,000 a month, when I qualify you, what I do is I shoot for the number of the price of the house in loan amount with taxes and insurance and everything to get you $2,000 a month. And then that's when you can decide, okay, that's only $200,000. I can't buy a house for $200,000. Or it can go the opposite. I could tell you, you can have $250,000 for $2,000 a month and you're shocked that you can get that much house. Right. So I like that question a lot um, just because it sets the expectation of where you want to be. Now, do we hit that expectation all the time? No, because especially in the last few months, because $2,000 six months ago, eight months ago is different than what $2,000 was a year and a half ago. And lots of times people look at me like, oh my, that's, that's all I can get for $2,000. And yes, that's, that's where it is today is, you know, that's the price that you can get. And that's when we start talking about buy downs and different types of loans and what's out there that might help you get more house for that same money. Well, I can attest to that working with customers that we've we've shared through the years yeah a hundred percent of the feedback is just what you said it was let's focus on what we're comfortable with paying first and then like the other feedback i get from from you personally through our, through customers is outside of let's focus this is where we're comfortable we get a range like okay, maybe that wasn't the price range that fits our budget to where we're comfortable. So now let's talk about a range. Yeah. And what can we get for 200 versus 220? And what's that change my payment? And then when we're out shopping, uh, boots on the ground, Yeah. you know, in their mind, they, they can be making decisions, right? Yep. And I think that's where shopping with local lenders like yourself is beneficial versus an online guru because- yep. The, the online there's several online traps right but yep. one of them is just being able to to talk this through and, and what makes sense for, the, for that family right? the other advantage we have of being local is i have a really good idea of what property taxes are mm -hmm. on different areas of town um there's there's a part of gillette where the property taxes are double what the rest of the town is. And it's because they have a special assessment. So okay. if you come in and I qualify you for 250 and then you find the house that's in that particular area of town, that payment just changed because the property taxes probably are almost double, if not double, what that same price house is across town. Right. And it's because they did new curb and gutter, they did sewer, they did city water, they added all that on. But all that was paid for by the property taxes for that area, and they stretched it out over 10 to 15 years um, to pay for it. Right. And if you don't know that, when you go there and look, it could be a big shock when you want to make the offer on that house. So what I do is when somebody basically calls and says, I'm going to make an offer, I get the address. And then I go in and I'm like, OK, so this is what the taxes are. This is closer what the payment's going to be. Now we have a better idea of where you are. Um, yeah. You know, the only thing I can't really look up to get you an exact payment is your homeowner's insurance because I can't provide that. You have to get that yourself. So if your budget's tight, it's a good idea to call and get a quote before you lock in on that house. Um, homeowner's insurance that is something that has changed drastically in the last 12 months. Um, there is lots of places where their homeowners has doubled or gone up by 50%. And you really want to check that out before you jump in, just because it, it could be a shocker. And the other thing that a lot of people don't know, if that home had a claim on it, so say they had a kitchen fire in the last three years, that claim follows the house. It follows the owner of the house, but it also follows the house. So when you go in and you try to buy that property, your insurance could come back really, really expensive 
because there was a claim on that home in the last three years that you have nothing to do with, but you're going to pay for it. So it's something just to be careful about, you know, especially if your budget's tight. I mean, if your budget's tight and you can only, you know, where your payment has to be, these are a couple items you really want to look at just to be safe. Well, and a golden nugget there too is, uh, as we both experience, uh, you showed where credit score could have an impact on interest rates going up, going down, uh, yep. buying discount points like that all played a factor on your end. Same way with insurance. And, yeah. you know, if your credit health is good and you can prove that through your credit score, you're going to get better pricing on both sides of the deal. Now, all of a sudden you can live a little bit more comfortably. So. I, you know, a lot of folks don't know that yet or haven't realized it, that every day we should be working on our financial health and yep. improving that credit score. Yep. Um, property tape does play a big difference on homeowners insurance, too. You know, yeah. um, if it's if it's a double wide versus a stick built, that insurance yep. is going to be way more expensive on a double wide. Yep. Um, if it's a unique home, berm home or something like that, that affects the pricing on insurance as well. So. You know, if it's a unique house or there's just something different about it, you really want to get quotes up front just to be safe. Yep. And it truly does follow the person and the property. I seen one close here recently and I got to learn what the insurance quote was and I about puked in my chair. But yeah. it had to do, it followed them from out of state. The claim yep. followed them from out of state. Yeah. And nothing to do with the property they bought. I mean, nope. some of it did. It was the property type that they bought, right? But the other part of it, it followed the borrower. Yeah, and it does, and it will. Yeah. Because insurance, even if you switch insurance companies, so you're with company A and you have a claim and they pay out $50,000 for repair your house, you sell that house, you move out of state, you move into a different property, you get a new loan and you go to a different insurance company, you're still getting hit with that claim. Even though that insurance company did not pay anything out on your previous claim, you're still higher because they're taking you as risk and it makes your new house more expensive. And that's what insurance is, is risk assessment. Yep. Yep. Uh, talk, you alluded to it a little bit ago. Let's dive into the rabbit hole of uh, traps. Uh, and I see traps all the time online, especially like yeah. you, you, you got store hours, right? Yep. But online it's 24 hours a day. Yeah. And so people are sitting at home on the internet on their phones and they stumble into a couple different mortgage companies that are online gurus. One of the things I see, uh, and I'll just put this out there and you can take on uh, with it after I'm done, but like I, if I jump on bankrate.com, I can compare Rocket Mortgage to Garden State Homes to Homeify to whoever, right? Yep. And if you're not paying attention, It'll show an interest rate that's lower than what your local lender said. Yep. And it'll show another interest rate that's probably in line with what everybody's saying. And in the fine print, like you really got to squint. Yeah, it says small. with discount points. Yep. Meaning, and you said it a bit ago, they're up fronting the, the closing costs and not, you know, they're not disclosing it in yep. the, that initial screen. Yeah. They're not giving yeah. you all the information that you need to make a decision that really makes sense for you. <clears throat> right. And that's how they get people hooked. And, you know, some of the new rules that have come into play with mortgage in the last couple of years, they've tried to stop that. You know, they've tried to tried to make it where it's more transparent. Um, and one of the ways they did that is we went from a settlement statement to a closing disclosure. OK, so when you buy a house, or refine a house, we have to give you your closing statement, which is your CD is what it's called. We have to give that to you three business days before you close. Those are supposed to be your final figures. OK, and it gives you three days to look at it to determine, did they actually give me what they told they were going to give me? You know, did they give me the rate I was told? Are my closing costs what I was told? And it gives you the time to look at it. The problem with this system is that's supposed to be final. But with a lot of lenders, especially onliners, they don't stick to it. They change it. So they give you one thing and then they change it by the time you get to closing. And it's not supposed to work that way. But like everything, there's loopholes and there's workarounds and they should be exactly the same. 
And one thing I can tell you with me, if you get your CD and it's before closing, like it's supposed to be, that CD is what we call balanced. And that means it's been through the title company. They have made their adjustments. They have the final taxes. They have everything worked in. And the number that I give you, that's the number you're going to see when you come to the table to sign your papers. And that's what the rule's supposed to do. It's supposed to make it that way. So you have those three days to determine if you're getting what you're supposed to get. Um, the problem with it is when you're buying a house and you get those numbers, even if they don't match, 99.9% .9 of the people are like, well, I want the house. And the onlineers know that. There, 99 people are going to go sign those papers, even if they aren't what they were supposed to get. And then what happens is I get a call <laughs> six months later and they tell me the story. And if you stay local, that's not going to happen for the most part. I mean, I'm not saying it's never going to happen with somebody, but it's not going to happen nearly as often. Um, the other thing I like to tell people, I'm here. You, if you're driving by, we're on 59, just you know, Jason's basically on 59 too, most popular road in town. You're driving by, come in. I'm here. I'm here. I'm in this office, eight to five, Monday through Friday. And if you say you're a coal miner, you're on shift work. You don't get off work till six o'clock. You can't be in town till seven. That's okay. Call me. Just like Jason, I'll come meet you. I'll right. stay. I'll come to the office. You know, right. if your only day off is Saturday and you can't come in, I'll come meet you on Saturday. It, it's That's one of the advantages of being in town. I mean, I'm going to be available. And if I'm not available, one of the gals that works for me, they'll be available because there's always somebody that's willing to come in and talk with you, go through options, get you approved, you know, go through the figures, make sure you're comfortable with what you're getting. Well, I'll add to your, we'll just call it a bait and switch on the yeah. onliners, but I've, I've seen yeah. it. I've, I can attest, I've seen it with the local lender too. Uh, or whether it was intentional or not, I have no idea, but here's here. Trevor summed it up, right? Like you're three days before closing or you're sitting at the closing table. I don't care what day it is. And you're excited. You got the moving crew. You got the family yeah, here. You're, packed. you're moving into the house like it's a big life event. And then boom. Well, Trevor's right. At that point, you're not going to say no. 99% of people are not going to say no. They're not yeah. going to walk away from the deal, nor do they want the ramifications from the seller. Yeah. Because now the seller is going to be upset. Right. Right. Because most, fact, most of the time, a, your seller's buying a house the next day or an hour later. So right. they're now just, they're in a bad spot too. It's a horrific snowball effect yep uh, you know we, so. we call it a chain um and every loan every cross every customer is a link in the chain and i've been in transactions where there was seven links in the chain which means mm -hmm. the first buyer seller if they don't close there's six buyers and sellers behind them that now can't close can't buy can't sell right um stressful you know, and if you're the first buyer and you get to the table and the stuff isn't what it's supposed to be, now your seller can't sell. Now he can't right. buy. And it just keeps flowing. And it it knocks. I mean, you're you're talking about 25, 30 people now that are affected by the fact that your information and paperwork wasn't what it was supposed to be. And when you're an onliner and you're the loan officer and the company behind that. What are you going to do? You're going to call them? They're just not going to take your call. They know that what they did, and it has no ramifications on them. The agents, the title companies, the appraisers, none of those people are getting what they're supposed to get because that first link in the chain didn't close like it was supposed to. Again, that's when you're dealing local. You, know, you, and, your, you and Jason come in and see me on in person. We'll fix it, you know? So it's just, you're better off where you can see somebody and you can come talk to them. You know, I go to Walmart. I'm going to run into you in Walmart. I, I want you to go, hey, there's Trevor. Shake my hand and be happy to see me. I don't want you to go, oh, that's the guy that screwed up my loan. And now seven people didn't get to buy their houses that day. Uh, that's that's not who I want to be. And nobody that works for me wants to be that person either. So, 
Uh, I think something else we should mention, uh, talking about buy downs and better in our lives. Uh, when you're purchasing a, a property, rates are not locked until you get an executed contract. And then the refinance is different on your side. You want to dive into that? Yeah. So we can't lock an interest rate for you on anything until you actually have a purchase contract and a closing date. Because your interest rate lock is only for X amount of days. So the longer out term you lock, so you've got 15, 30, 45, 60. That's how they're looked at as far as the terms of how long you're locking it for. So the shorter amount of time you lock for, the better the pricing is going to be. The longer amount of time you lock for is the is the worst pricing. Now, and I don't, I don't mean over your loan. I just mean for those days prior to closing. So if you're closing in 28 days, your contract is in, you're closing in 28 days. When I price it, I'm looking at a 30 day lock because I need 30 days to get you to your closing date. Okay. Now that pricing is going to be good because most of us in the industry try to stick with a 30 day lock if we can. And that gives you the pricing that's pretty standard. Okay. Now you can gamble, you can roll the dice. So, which we've done a lot your contract comes in and you're 32 days out from closing and I'm looking at what rates are doing. I'm probably not going to lock you on a 45 day that day to get you 32 days. I'm going to see what the stock market's doing. I'm going to see what the bond market's doing, see what the talk is in the government. And we might roll the dice and wait a week. We might wait two weeks and see what happens. Now, before I lock it, I'm going to call you and say, Hey, this is where we're at today. You know, we got to get it locked. You're closing in two weeks. So what do you think? Should we lock it or not? And I leave it up to you to decide if we should lock it. Now, I'm going to tell you what I think, but ultimately it's your call on if you want me to do it or not. Um, refis are a little different because there's no specific set term on when you need to close. Now, we still try to close them in 30 days or less just because, you know, that's what you want to do. You want to get them closed and, you know, get them the better rate. When you're doing a refi, I can lock you on the first day. We can gamble and wait a week, two weeks, three weeks. It's whatever you want to do. Um, you know, I, I've been doing this a long time and I've, I watch the markets continuously. I'm not going to say I win most of the time, but over my career, by watching what the markets are doing, I've probably won 80%, 90% of the time. As far as did they get better, did they get worse? Um, those conversations when you got to call somebody and say, hey, the market collapsed, your rate went up a quarter, not much I can do, sorry, I got to lock it. I don't like those calls. Not my favorite at all, but I really like calling somebody and saying, hey, we got them down a half today. Let's lock it. This is your new payment. And they're going to say, yep, let's lock it. Those are the calls I really like, you know, and then you get to closing and everybody's really happy because their payment dropped, their closing costs dropped, and it looks great. So, well, flip that over. Like, say you got locked and we didn't get close. Like, the world's not perfect, right? Things right. don't always execute the way we hope. Yep. Uh, the 28 days turns into 32, but you were locked on a 30. Yep. Uh, talk we can about do an extension. Yeah. Um, you can get extensions on your locks. They do cost, however, because you're buying more days. Now, that cost can change. Um, Depends what the market did. So if we locked you at six and a half and we get down to the end and rates are maybe a little bit better than six and a half, I can't lower your rate, but I can get you the extension for little to nothing. Um, there's also the option of, it used to be used a lot, was a float down, which means we'd lock you. And then if rates got better, we could relock you. That isn't allowed as much as it used to be. Investors do not like that. Um, and when I lock a loan with an investor, I'm basically committing to taking those funds at that rate. So when I cancel that lock and move you to somebody else for a better rate, it comes back on me later. Sometimes it's worth it though. You know, it just depends. So you can't do it 10 times in a month, but if you did it once or twice, you can probably be all right. How many, how many times do you think 
uh, doing buy downs, whether it's the temporary or the the permanent, how many times do you think that's been a, a game changer for that customer throughout your years? You know, that, that's a tough question. Um, <clears throat> the, the lowering of the stress of knowing what your house payment's going to be and it's in your budget is kind of the answer to that question. Um, you know, some people can make $100,000 a year and they could make a $3,000 a month house payment with absolutely no problem. The next person could make $100,000 a year and they can't be comfortable making $1,500 a month house payment. It, it all depends on how you live your life. What's your lifestyle? You know, do you go to Starbucks three times a day? Do you go out to eat every day? Those things add up and that's what can change your comfort level on that payment. Um, I've had the opposite too. I mean, I've had people that make $50,000 a year. They could take a $2,000 a month house payment and make it without a problem. I mean, it's not even an issue for them because their lifestyle is different. You know, they, they, they live their lifestyle where they don't go out all the time. They don't spend money on things that really aren't necessary. You know, they live a little different, more frugally, you know, um, but that's not really the way the world is now for the most part. You know, we got what three new coffee places opened up now in the last two weeks. Mm -hmm. They're not open them because they're not going to make money. They're open them because people buy a $5, $6 cup of coffee two, three times a day. Right. And, and I mean, those things can change how you qualify to get your mortgage because it, it what can you spend? You know, it's not what I say you can have. It's what can you actually afford in your mind, you know, what, what can you make comfortably without it being a stressful situation every single month to make your payment? Um, I can tell you the last thing that I want and Jason wants is for you to buy a house. Give us a call in three months and say, I can't do it. I can't make it. This doesn't work. I can't make this house payment. I can't live here anymore. That's the last thing we want to have. We don't want to put somebody in that situation. And at three months, depending on what the rates have done, it might not be a possibility for either of us to help you fix that problem. And you don't want to put your house back on the market after three months. But if you can't make the payment and you we can't lower it, that's your really your only option. Right. So yeah, the only person that wins in that scenario is me. <laughs> like, honestly. Yeah. Well, but you still don't yeah. like it though. No, I hate it. Like you, that's you that don't want somebody to. Yeah. You don't you don't spend thirty days to six months to a year with somebody and and kind of shaping up what they want in life, just to turn around in less than three or six or mm -hmm. we we'll call it even twenty four months. Like yeah, I don't want that phone call. No, like, we didn't work this hard to get you to where you wanted to be just to learn that it didn't work out for you. Yeah, it was never our intention. We never want to set anybody up to fail. Right. And, you know, life changes too. I mean, there's things that can happen that your circumstance has changed and now you can't afford it. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about from where you are right now, what you can do and what you're comfortable with. You know, if something happens and you get hurt at work and now you're on workman's comp, or, you know, anything catastrophic that changed in your life that now you can't actually afford to be where you were, those things are unexpected. You know, we can't predict that. You can't predict that. Um, right. But we're talking about those times where it just got stretched too far in the beginning and it probably shouldn't have happened in the first place. Those are the things we really want to avoid. You right. know, we want to put you in a place where you move into that house and you're happy and making the payments isn't hard. And you are just ecstatic that you got that place. You right. know, and th those are what we want, you know. Um, I'm going to comment about the, the permanent buy down for a second and sure. kind of challenge people's thought processes and add to a little bit what you said. Uh, doing the permanent buy down uh, on the interest rates, uh, you could be a, an ultra saver or an ultra payer, if you will. Yeah. Like say... I tell Trevor I'm comfortable with fifteen hundred dollars a month, and in reality I could afford twenty five hundred, right? Yep. 
Well, my goal is we sit down and we're, we're going through goal strategies and goal setting. I mentioned to Trevor, hey, I only want a $1,500 a month payment because in reality, I'm going to make $2,500 a month payment because I want to apply $1,000 a month extra payment because there's no prepayment penalties on mortgages, right? Not anymore. Right? So now all of a sudden we get to have this conversation of uh, thinking outside the box and be like, okay, if I get my interest rate down from uh, seven to six and a half, okay, and then I apply another thousand on top of that every month, yeah, and we know the recoup on not making extra payments, you know, how how can I better myself and how can I better my family? Well, that involved? extra money is technically, in reality, it's affecting your rate because you're prepaying your principal. So what most people don't realize is your your interest is figured monthly. Right. It's figured off your balance at the time. So it's not figured off the total. It's figured off what you owe that day. So by paying extra next month, when you make your normal payment, you made more money towards your principal that month than you normally would have because you paid your loan down last month. Uh, now, in Jason's scenario of $1,000 a month, the first thing I would do in that situation is I would say, well, let's shorten your term because if we're looking at a 30-year loan and then you tell me, well, I'm going to pay this much extra, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to price you out on a 15-year loan. The interest rate on a 15-year is lower than it is on a 30 so you're cutting your term in half, but I'm also lowering your rate. So your normal house payment might have just jumped up to 2200 from the 1500 but you already shortened your term and you got a better rate. So if you're going to now pay 2500 a month, you're actually still throwing that extra 300 on your balance every month, but you really double whammied your extra money because you just got a better fixed rate and you're going to pay your house off at a pace that's way faster than normal. Right. And that's that's a huge golden nugget for everybody watching. And the other golden nugget that you just said there that nobody really considers, and, and I do because I'm always outside the box thinking, uh, and I, I had this conversation with some customers of mine down in Cheyenne a couple weeks ago. You just nailed it where the, the amount owed on your loan is recalculated every month. Every month. And when people are looking at their investments, you know, stock market, Roths, 401ks, you know, whatever, they, they talk about the returns per year, right? Yep. We're talking, you're not comparing apples to apples. So sometimes we see this conversation, well, I'm better off doing, getting a bigger home mortgage and chasing my, you know, my retirement funds, yep. you know, whatever, whatever yep. they want to chase. Well, it's not a fair comparison in some examples. No, and it, it used to be, what you're talking about used to be easier because if your interest rate on your house was only 3%, you could probably take that extra money and make five or 6% in the market, you know, by investing it. So your money ahead, but now with rates being higher, you're better off paying your loan down faster because your money ahead, because you're probably not making as much as you were on your investment versus your interest rate. So right. you really got to analyze your, you know, what your costs are and what your benefits are as far as where you're putting those funds. Yeah, and look at, and just to challenge those watching, like look at your volume per year, not per month, or at least put it on the same scale. Yeah. And look at the returns or the cost on the same scale. Yeah. That's when the real numbers start showing up. Yeah. Uh, for, for everybody watching, um, like on my my websites, I have calculators that'll help you. Like when Trevor's not open and I'm not open during business hours and it's midnight yeah. and you can't sleep and you're thinking about this. I have calculators on my websites to do this. I assume you do too. Yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah. there's a, there's tools on there you can use to figure out what payments would be and you know what interest rates are. Kind of. I mean, we can't. You can't legally. Um, advertise rates anymore uh, because there's too many moving parts in it. So you, that's why you, you'll you almost never see a mortgage company advertise, we're at five today and put it in print because if you put it in print, you have to be able to get it. And the disclaimer underneath is going to be three paragraphs long. If you see somebody posting a rate like that, um, we don't do that because of the, you know it's a risk that we just can't take. So, I mean, to get an actual accurate number you really need to call in but um but the tool does work it gets you close 
And what, where should they go to get that from you? Um, we're at myunify.com. And if you want, you can get into mine. If you just search my name under Unify, it'll bring up the link for Gillette. And then there's, you can do applications on there. You can do, you know, check payments on there. Um, you know, if, if you like doing, if you're techie and you like to do computer stuff more than in person, uh, we can do the whole process through there. Um, you can load all your documents in there. All your stuff comes by e-signature. Um, you know, it used to be we'd see somebody four or five times throughout the process of the loan to get it closed. Now there's times I go to closing and that's the first time I see in person. Yeah. Well, and that back to when you started this conversation this evening, look at all the changes throughout oh, yeah. the years. That's yeah. one of them. Yeah. It used to be every document had to be uh, FedEx or mailed or UPS, you know, and my FedEx guy became one of my best friends because he was in my office twice a day, every day, picking up and delivering. I don't even hardly print anything anymore. Almost yeah. never because everything just goes online and we don't have to do any of that. So, yep. Uh, any other tips or tricks you want to share with people this evening? Uh, you know, just make sure you look at your options bef before you make a decision, you know, um, make sure you know exactly what you're getting into, you know, what your terms are, you know, what your rates are, you know, make sure you, you get an idea of what taxes are insurance, all those things. Cause it affects you. Um, I mean, in a house payment for the most part, you know, it, it's, I don't want to say it's a lifelong commitment, but when you start one, it kind of feels like it. So, you know, it's a big decision. So just make sure you do ask the questions and you're comfortable with what you're doing before you go in and just jump in with both feet. Just make sure that you know exactly where you stand. No. Uh, is there any, any, for those watching, is there any more questions? I haven't seen any come in in a while. Well, if I see something, I'll let you know, but okay. um, I think we'll wind this up for the evening. Uh, Trevor, what's the best way for folks to get a hold of you? Um, you know, I'm old school. I, I like to talk to people. I like to, even if it's on the phone, you know, I like to see people face to face. I like to talk. Um, reason that is, is you, you get a better feeling for people when you get to speak to them or see them face to face. Um, obviously we do have all the tools, you know, we've got the online apps, we've got everything. You, you can do this whole thing without ever coming in. Um, but I like to see people because it, when you come in and sit down, I think you can build that comfort and rapport where you you can trust, you know, you know that we're doing what we should be doing for you. Um, I don't know if you can really do that when you never speak to a person. So I mean, even if you do all your line online apps, and I'm probably one of the rare people that do this, but when an online app comes in to me and everything's filled out, you know what the first thing I do is? I pick up the phone. I call you. I, I, it's just the way I I am because I want to hear your voice. I want to see your reactions. I want to know exactly what you're looking for. I mean, I want to know everything that you can tell me so that when I'm doing this, I know I'm doing what you want and I'm getting you what you need. You don't have that when it's all online. Yeah. Well, and the other thing to add to that that we got to be cognitive of in both of our line of work is the way the internet's changed things and so fast the last couple of, in the last two years yeah. specifically, the number of spam, spam yeah. the number of spammers out there. Like we have to crazy. qualify people uh, at some point. The qualification has to be in person. Yeah. Because uh, the level of spamming out there in the world right now, nobody can stay ahead of it. No. Nope. Uh, there's law enforcement staying ahead of it or trying trying to catch up, but there's no way they can get ahead yeah, of it. They can't. It's just yeah. it's and it's the way it's always going to be. I think I just I don't think they do enough to try to catch those people. And when they do catch them, I don't think they do enough to make an example of them. Right. You know, we get it here all the time. I get an email that says it's from one of the owners of our company and it says I'm supposed to wire him this much money. It's not him. He's not going to call me and tell me to wire him money, but they don't that they, they try it. You know, it happens all the time. Title companies are getting hit constantly, yeah. constantly with them demanding wires. Yeah. Um, 
it's just you know we had one just the other day where it showed the email came from one of my employees to one of the owners of the company and demanding that he pay this invoice demanding it and he called me immediately and i looked at him and go that's not her he's like how do you know i'm like well first of all she would never talk to you that way because she would come to me first and second of all they did a really good job but they misspelled her last name by one letter and it looked like it was her but it wasn't and yeah. that email it was trying to get him to pay a bill through um linkedin is where it came from so just gotta be careful yeah we're we're seeing all kinds of stuff on our side and it's it's mind-blowing how smart some of these people are it really is yeah so back to your point like at some point having a conversation with people goes a long ways yeah for us yep um i don't see any questions coming in so uh, uh everybody that's watching this or watches it later you can get a hold of trevor anytime as you know by now he's willing to answer questions and absolutely and it doesn't matter like for him or myself it doesn't matter if the transaction happens next month next year two years from now yep uh, build a team and start working on it together because it's a buying real estate's a big deal right if you don't think you can qualify for whatever reason that's okay you can still come in and talk to us. Um, you know, say you've had some credit issues and you just don't think you can qualify. We'll still talk to you. Come in. Right. I'll sit down with you. Um, somebody in my office will sit down with you and we'll go through what's happened and try to help you figure out a plan to fix it. And it's worked. I mean, I've got hundreds of clients in the last 20 years where the first time they came in, they couldn't buy a house. But we went through it, got a plan, told them what to do. They did the things that needed to be done. They fixed their credit three months, six months, 12 months later, they bought a house. Yep. And, you know, it's the process, sometimes it takes longer. It's just the way it is. But, you yeah. know, just because you might have poor credit now doesn't mean you can never buy a home. Right. So, yeah, for either one of us, you can get a hold of us anytime, phone, uh, email, get on the websites, whatever. Um yeah, just just engage and be open and and also diligent at the same time, right? Yep. Like there's there's that. Yeah, you got to so, do the work, you know, to fix it. We can't fix it for you, but if you do what you need to do, it'll happen yep. for you. <clears throat> yep. So, all right. Well, I think we'll shut her down for the evening if nobody right. has anything else. Great. Well, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Man, that your some of this information was that was mind blowing. Like I told you, I was cool. gonna share as much as I could. Yeah, like thanks for sharing that. That yeah, was absolutely. And hopefully, even some people that watch this later, hopefully they get quite a little out of this. Because yeah, and like, like, like Jason said, if you watch this and you have questions, just call or swing by the office. So yep. So okay, well, have a good evening. All right, thanks everybody. Yep, thank you everybody. Bye.